opportunities is a great advantage, even in the age of machine learning and automatic translation. So we cannot ignore the utility of our own comprehension if we are to continue learning ourselves. In concluding, I wish to reiterate how vital I see the path ahead in Central European historiography. Perhaps her history is going global indeed. It has been for many years already, but we have not been aware of its full potential. Yet in finding the way forward, the scholarly community as a whole must find a suitable toolkit in order to bring Hatsuk history into a more appropriate global setting and, more generally, to reap the benefits of recent historical, uh, historical trends towards considerations of the global itself. To do so is only right as it recaptures the reality of the past for an empire upon which the, first, the sun first never set and for whose rulers went yet further and for whom the road was not enough. Thank you very much. <laughs>
of Karpovica. And uh, so our greatest wish was, uh, so when we met in Graz in two, 2011, to establish a Croatian society uh, for research of 18th century, 18th century studies research. And I must say throughout all these years that uh, there were many, many incentives, but we never made it. So it, it was, a, it was every, every time it failed. And I really hope that this occasion, because today I'll be just a footnote to these lectures. I was invited to be the first speaker. So the first idea was to make a public interview with uh, uh, Jonathan and Veronica. Uh, but then, for the sake of doctoral, doctoral students and their level of understanding, uh, and following these historiographical th threats, then we decided to, to make it uh, uh, more, uh, uh, I would say, traditional. So that present our work, and uh, since the form requires the third presenter, I was invited to be the third presenter. So this occasion, so this uh, uh, meeting, uh, for me, it's really a kind of uh, uh, opportunity to offer young scholars and my colleagues uh, to, to, get, to, to come together and to establish a kind of a research group uh, for uh, 18th century studies in Croatia. And at the end, I would like you, so everybody who will be interested, I would like uh, him or her to, to leave the contact so that we can start with this kind of interaction, with uh, giving presentations, with uh, informing each other, with going together to conferences so that I'm not solitary every time, you know, seeing all those uh, European societies and world societies with a lot of members, and I was always uh, just catching up with people I know, <laughs> and you can, you can uh, Veronica can confirm that. And okay, today I was, uh, so hopefully there will be some uh, interest, we'll see. And today I was invited to make a comment, since this is a methodological, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, our approach should be methodological, I was invited by Zrinka Blažević to make a comment uh, on my book, so actually my revised MA thesis, uh, which I defended in 1999, and I published 10 years later in 2009. And why? Uh, it's because in the meantime, I was a doctoral student at the Central European University, and I defended my, BA, uh, my uh, PhD thesis, and after four years at CU, um, I really became informed about historiographical trends and uh, cutting edge uh, approaches and actually it was me so uh, I that, uh, reproduced uh, and revised my MA thesis in, in the sense that I used the concepts that uh, when I was defending my MA thesis 10 years before I was barely aware of that they ever existed so and you can see from the from the title that uh, 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 the title of my MA thesis this was Intellectual Development of Walter Zadam Kirchelic. My supervisor, he uh, actually asked me to study the, uh, the education, so the childhood and the education, so very traditional in the sense of the history of education, of maybe the most uh, uh, well-known uh, Croatian enlightener from the middle of the 18th century. So it was really rather traditional approach, so I was just supposed to identify the phases of his education and to see uh, where his critical mind comes from. But uh, 10 years later, then I become aware that uh, th this was not enough. So when I was asked by my, the head of the Institute, Croatian Institute of History, to publish my MA thesis finally, then I really opted for uh, reconceptualization. Re and so this uh, traditional title became the world of Balthazar Adam Kirchelich, education between hidden time Catholicism and the Catholic Enlightenment. And how this came into being? So first, uh, just a few words, because not everybody maybe doesn't know that uh, Balthazar Adam Kirchelich was actually the most extraordinary, most well-known Enlightenment in Croatia, in Croatia at this time. And uh, precisely because of his connections, he was connected everywhere. He, he was in Central European networks, so he left uh, uh, 
collection of over 500 letters. Uh, he, he was connected in Croatia, so he was a Zagreb Kevin, and uh, um, this gave him opportunity to uh, be in different uh, commissions, so he had different roles, uh, even political roles, because the Bishop of Zagreb was uh, usually uh, also involved in the, uh, in the political uh, management of the country. Sometimes he, Bishop of Zagreb was banned, and uh, he was the one who was in charge of, the, of running the country. Uh, Balthazar Adam Krčelic was uh, extremely communicative. He was in all society and he was in secret writing in Latin a kind of uh, chronicle of private and public life in Croatia. And this is what he's uh, most famous for. So he wrote this Anwe for the uh, yearbooks uh, from 1747 to uh, to, to 1764, and this, uh, when, when he died, then uh, those who were in charge of uh, his uh, uh, inheritance, when they opened the, this uh, diary, so this Anwar, so they were shocked, so because there were so many details from, from the everyday life, so many scandals and uh, uh, unpleasant things, that uh, in order to save this uh, chronicle from burning, so uh, his pupil, Nikola Škrlec, he was asked to, to uh, write, so to make these passages to write in black, uh, in black color. So, and this is how we, we have this chronicle say. Uh, and Krčelic was so a kind of, uh, when you were, two, two of you were mentioning all these examples, so he, uh, he was the one who, uh, and he writes in, in, in Anwe, he was the one who, who was uh, uh, transferring news, global news, to the Croatian society. So he writes about Nikola Plandić, who was actually, I don't know if you uh, found him in his book about Paraguay, he was the Jesuit who was uh, actually charged for um, establishing a Christian republic in, in Paraguay. And, and this Nikola Plandić actually came back to Croatia at that time and became a Croatian, uh, teacher of rhetoric in Varaždin, and he was, so Krčević was very anti-Jesuit, and he was, in, he was giving a lot, a lot of uh, information, uh, negative information about the Jesuit order. Uh, but um, Nikola Plantić was a, a somebody who, who lived at that time, so he's, he was connected to, to South America, and Krčević knew about it, and he was propagating this black, black legend against Jesuits at that time. And uh, so we, we must think, when we are talking about Hedberg monarchy, about the Hedberg subjects, unfortunately, I must say, and I've been following the historiographical production, we don't see Croats in this. We don't see Croatian perspective in, in, this, uh, uh, in this field. And we can, with, with every um, photographic um, uh, fact, we can, we can make these connections. And Krčelic, he was also uh, networked on the, in, within Croatia since he was a confessor and uh, he was beloved in women's society. He, he knew many, many, many things. And of course, when he tried to expose uh, uh, critically the, the sad reality, the state of the Croatian kingdoms in the middle of the 18th century, he was uh, persecuted. And he was the one who was uh, we can say that he, it was the first politically um, political imposed trial in Croatia. So he was, uh, in, in the middle of the 18th century, he was tried for uh, being a traitor. So, and uh, the Bishop of Zagreb, who was his greatest enemy, he accused him of propagating very, uh, for today it's maybe not, not so shocking, but at that time, to be tried for homosexuality, for spending too much money, for not being a proper priest. So those, those were really, really difficult and uh, heavy charges. And, uh, but in this way, this Balthazar Adam Krčelic is really a fantastic person to do both local, local and global history because he was the one and he is uh, regarded to be uh, one of the main um, informants of the first Croatian newspaper in Latin, Emeritus Agradiensis. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, 
uh, any copy the same, but uh, the, the, the publisher was the same who was publishing uh, uh, Batar Zadat and Krčelic uh, books, and we know that uh, he was the only one who had all these information from all his exchanges in, in his head. He was the only one who could write such a, a newspaper. And I was mentioning he worked, his work, so he's uh, maybe he's most famous for his Anwe, which I translated into Croatian. But he also uh, wrote two books, Civil uh, History of Croatia and Church History of Croatia, to the beginning of the 17th century. And we can find these books all around Central European libraries. So in, in Austria, in uh, Bohemia, in uh, Hungary, and he was reviewed in in many learned journals, because it was uh, exceptional. We can't say that uh, at this time in Croatia there were many, many uh, historians who were publishing such uh, works, but uh, he really opted for, um, for dissemination. So he published the books on his uh, account, and were, he was sending these books in order to uh, uh, put light on the Croatian history in Central Europe. So he was sending these books uh, all around and he was also receiving this gift exchange was uh, uh, vice versa. He also received a lot of books and uh, gifts from, from abroad. And so selection of sources. Uh, okay, I was interested in his uh, education and this was my uh, topic, my MA topic and what I had at the disposal I had in Zagreb in the uh, Archbishopric, Arch, uh, Bishopric, uh, Archive collections of institutional records. So these uh, institutions where he spent, uh, where, where he was schooled in Zagreb, Vienna, and Bologna. I will come to that afterwards. I had institutional chronicles and histories. I have institutional published book, books in Bologna. So this uh, uh, Illyrian Hungarian college published. Uh, the, uh, grammar of the Italian language. I have a Kirchhoff's ego documents, private letters, memories of early education and critical observations in the later works, his university scripts and contemporary biographies, orationes, funebres, or eulogies, which are also very, very helpful. And just one example. So he, um, he was born in 1750. And uh, first he was a um, Jesuit student, and then he decided to be, uh, not to be a Jesuit, but rather a diocesan priest, although his uncles were Jesuits, and then he attended uh, Zagreb Seminary. And he was a very, very gifted guy, boy. He was sent to further education to Vienna, and uh, this is how the uh, uh, Diocese of Zagreb, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's not so well known, it's not, it's not pointed out, emphasized, but it had, ever since the 16th and the early 17th century, expositors in Vienna, so they, they had a college a home for priestly candidates who studied at the uh, University of Vienna, and this was usually for the study of philosophy as a propedeutic subject. And then they were sent, the best students were sent to Bologna, where the Diocese of Zagreb also had a college called uh, Elidian Hungarian College, and where the best students would usually study law and theology. And Krčević was one of such students, brilliant students. He had many roles in these colleges. And what I found really uh, uh, very helpful and uh, since we were talked about correspondences as a, uh, fine, fine sources for uh, doing research on exchange. His uh, letters, early letters to his friend in Zagreb from Bologna. And here really we can see so many practices. So the practice that uh, he was writing in Latin to his friend. He was uh, inserting Croatian um, phrases into these letters. You can understand. Uh, he was um, uh, uh, sending gifts, he was uh, uh, discussing the, the war of the 
uh, Spanish succession and the armies. And uh, so he was a kind, he was a channel of the information to, to his uh, hometown. So he was informing his, it's not his real brother, he's in a way there, uh, we can study anthropology of friendship. It's, it's a very close connection when you, I, I translated these uh, letters from Latin into Croatian. It's a very, very close connection to, to this, uh, <coughs> to this boy, but uh, still he's, uh, really uh, trying to, to write about everything that was happening in Bologna at the time, and even smuggled books. So he, he's writing that he will get another book. So since all these letters were opened uh, by the superiors, that he's uh, kind of code. He was writing a code how he would send a, a very interesting uh, book about uh, um, it, it was uh, how um, um, the faces of animals actually reflected the characters of humans. And uh, it was very anthropological, but obviously it was not allowed because censorship was very strong. And he uh, put uh, another envelope, he took the cover of this book and put another cover. And how, this is how he smuggled the book to, to Zagreb. And so I think that uh, so these letters, which were actually let's say we knew that they existed but once you get deeper into them there are so many it's a wealth of information and so my conceptual approach was that of course i had these questions and i had to choose uh, concepts and actually the uh, as you can see in the introduction to my book which i also shared so one of the questions was uh, not to describe the early childhood and education of Balthazar Adam Kurchelich, but to, to get the answers, how was an early modern social and cultural identity formed in Croatia? What were the origins of this Kurchelich critical mind? And what I found interesting uh, was something that is opposite to what Veronica was saying, is that uh, it was not, it's not representations, but rather the experience of education and cultural trans transfers in the Catholic Tridentine institutions. So I, do, I didn't think about so diocese of Zagreb with its uh, branches in Vienna and Bologna, but I tried to put them in the broader context of the Catholic Tridentine institutions. And uh, since this mobility of students, priestly candidates was organized, so they really uh, had a chance to experience this transcultural uh, experience in, in different urban uh, environments such as Zagreb, Vienna and Bologna because at that time in Zagreb there was no university in the real sense of the word. There was a Jesuit academy and you could uh, study there philosophy and theology but it was not uh, a real university so uh, the diploma wasn't valid in the Hebrew monarchy. So you, can, you could study that, but the diploma was not valid since uh, Croatia was part of the Kingdom of Hungary and diplomas from Buddha were the ones that were actually uh, acknowledged. And this is why they were uh, going abroad and uh, studied at these centers, Vienna and Bologna, which I explained. And as you remember, so the, in my title, I used the word Svet or world, and this is actually, I didn't want to put the whole, uh, the, to translate the life world, it would be uh, a little bit difficult in creation, but it was the that meaning that I used this Lebensweld concept to describe, so this uh, social reality in which Balthazar uh, Adam was moving, so in different layers, so it was socially determined and uh, actually uh, he had the opportunity to interact with different within social groups and individuals and reproduce a new reality through his actions and thinking. And this is how he uh, became later, let's say, critical mind, in my opinion. The second concept, I don't want to, although Veronica announced that I would explain all those uh, different uh, uh, lines in the interpretation of uh, enlightenment. Uh, I, for me, it was since Kirchhoff was canonized as enlightenment, 
I, I really tried to uh, somehow interpret him within the Catholic Enlightenment. And I, I had no option because he was a Catholic priest and I really couldn't, uh, he, he was not, uh, he was very much uh, uh, anti voltarian he was uh, criticizing the Masonic society. So in this way, so it was difficult to um, canonize him as an uh, enlightener in the sense that he was anti-clerical and radical. So he was a priest. But uh, if you go deeper into the, into the concept, and thank God that in 2009 there were not so many books written about the Catholic Enlightenment, so I was at the beginning. But now there, is a, there has been an explosion of books, especially thanks to this man, Ulrich Hilleiner. I think that Veronica, you uh, <laughs> cooperated with him in the Dictionary of Catholic World Women, I think something like that. And, but he, he did, really did a lot in order to promote the Catholic Enlightenment, and he always says that the people would just, you know, slightly laugh at him when he, at the beginning, when he would mention that also the Catholic Church was uh, important in, in this sense. And actually, what is the main, so the, the, let's say, uh, common uh, conclusion to all those who deal with uh, this Catholic Enlightenment is that uh, uh, we can see in their actions the trend toward practicality, which was obvious after the Council of Trent, because Tridentine Catholicism tried to put into practice the conclusions of the Tridentine um, Council. And of course, they, this, this didn't stop this emphasis on education, on evangelization, missionary works, these practical things that uh, the, the idea of uh, St. Francis of uh, Sales that uh, everybody can be saint, so not only we don't need miracles, we need practical people who will be whose uh, uh, Christianity will be seen in this world as well. And this is something that uh, we find in the 18th century as well. So the agenda of Catholic Enlightenment was to use the newest achievements of philosophy and science and defend the dogmas of Catholic Christianity by explaining them in a new language. And of course, uh, the second, to reconcile Catholicism with modern culture. I will not go deeper into this, but uh, uh, I wanted to give just a small, small uh, example of uh, how this enlightened Catholic knowledge circulated. And uh, the cover of the, this little, little booklet written by Balthazar Adam Kerchelich, completely neglected. You can't find it in Google Books. It was never uh, uh, digitized, and you can read it just in the, uh, in the National Library in Zagreb. It's actually a kind of uh, example in this reproduction. So the main uh, figure of the Catholic Enlightenment, the Reform Catholicism, was the Italian uh, writer and historian uh, and theologian, moral theologian, Lodovico Antonio Muratori. And uh, when Kerchelich was in Bologna, he his teachers put him in touch with works of uh, Muratori. And of course, uh, he, the young priest was uh, um, delighted with, with such, uh, you know, with such new uh, idea of Christianity, with, which was based more on practices than on uh, some spiritual uh, miracles. And in, when Muratori died, so we can see from his note in Anue that uh, he really uh, unlike uh, Jesuits, he really <coughs> this man, and uh, he uh, actually uh, for uh, it was a kind of a, um, so one lady uh, uh, wanted to know more about it and asked uh, Kirchelich to write a kind of a, a lesson in the Holy Mass how how uh, women in the Holy Mass should, should uh, behave, how they, so in, he was asked to bring this Christian, new Christian ideal to, to the local women. And he wrote this uh, small booklet uh, about the Holy Mass and how uh, women should behave and uh, so he gives different advice, but what is important that he really cites his uh, sources, so it's uh, Muratori and uh, Francis of Salas. And this, this is also a kind of uh, example in this reproduction of and, uh, new knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
And we heard about this uh, concept, concept of circulation of knowledge. So it's really, I think, uh, if we talk about science, if we talk about scientific uh, achievements, so it's in the Croatian context, we, we have Ruja Boschkovic and uh, these celebrities. But if we, if we talk about knowledge, it's much easier. And I think that we, that who live in this 21st century, it's really, knowledge is everywhere. We, we talk about uh, society of knowledge, uh, uh, media knowledge, and this is something that is very, very useful in our 21st century. And what we really could see in these first two um, presentations that uh, really it's so easy to prove that knowledge is always evolving, changing and realizing through circulation between different societal spheres. And we are doing the transfer of knowledge in, in, in this moment as well. And this is why I invited this two speakers to somehow uh, uh, transfer their enthusiasm for, for their work to you, to transfer it to you. And so hopefully there will be some result out of it. Okay, this is it. <laughs> Shows that uh, 
This is the phase after the confessionalization. Uh, so it, uh, it was not so important to define uh, your, um, your religious boundaries or your religious uh, confession, but it was uh, considered very important that people feel um, uh, or have religious feelings and cultivate religious feelings so that religion is an, also a matter of emotions. Because I think that uh, it was um, agreed that if, uh, if the religion is heartfelt, then people, uh, that it will have effects in people's lives. And this was something that was, that could be shared across confessions. So there was more emphasis on practical Christianity and love one's neighbor. And this was actually very, very enlightenment mm -hmm. phenomenon, you know, finding ways to other confessions and finding that religiously motivated um, charity, for example, and, uh, and practical activities spring from, from religious feelings of people and they could be Catholic but they could also be Protestant and they could, this is this is the aspect where where we could speak about maybe religious blending which we see obviously in the Chicago and families. Thank you for that. Thank Thank you. Can you explain us uh, why it was important for, to translate in German because French was lingua franca and they could not understand each other very well and they didn't have a need for translating, but why am I to translate when you know? Yes, this is a very good question. Well, the Spoken family had an ambition to also reach out to um, middle and lower social strata, especially burgers, so not necessarily really lower class people still could not read, but possibly but were burgers or members of the Hofstadt or, or servants, or we could say maybe something like um, local elites. So these would be these would be teachers, these would be these would be their servants, these would be people who were important in the in the uh, city administration. So they, they tried to, to, to spread this uh, um, the pietist style literature to actually inspire and promote and move people to heartfelt religion with the idea and hope and then they will be they'll be active they'll 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 be active in various types of, of, of um, charitable activities be it donations for, for religious purposes or be it, be it uh, support of schools etc so so basically they wanted to reach the maybe middle class people and German was still the uh, uh, Lingua Franca of the middle class people because the two very French people mostly needed governances and they need to sort of help elite education. Thank you, Vlado, for a very good question. <laughs> I showed you, for example, 
um, when I talked about these missions between 1750 and 1850. I had a pair of shoes on one side, pictures of boxes in the middle, and then a guy studying in his library, right, and speaking. So it, it's a nice sort of pictorial way to show that process, I think, because the shoes are actually from China, which were worn by slaves in the bush in, uh, in South America. And they acquired those shoes from those locals when they were also traveling with them to acquire these plants and these kind of uh, commodities. And then the boxes were devised um, by, not scientists, but by these people who had to find real solutions. How would we get these plants or these animals back home without them dying? So they had to come up with sort of ways of, of new technology, in a sense, to transport them. Like not refrigerators or anything like this, but just boxes that could keep these plants safe. And then, you know, back in Vienna, then there's that study, you know, in the comfort of, of these palatial laboratories or libraries and so on like this. So I see it as a continual sort of thing. You know, without that first step, without that sort of native or, or um, indigenous step, you don't get that end production of knowledge. So I see it much more in that sense. Where you might want to bring in something like the Daily idea is in the sense of those experiences that are shared and those mental worlds that those people have and then what happens when those come into contact with another and then how they either change or expand you, know, you can think of transculturation, acculturation all these kind of ideas as well possibly but that's uh, it's a good point but that's not something that I've necessarily thought through Thank you <laughs> no, I also think that Levenswell, the concept of Levenswell is appropriate for my historical biographical approach and because you can then uh, really go deep into, into somebody's lives without uh, uh, doing this in, in an anecdotal way, you are actually describing context. And what, what I found interesting is that in this first Josephinian mission to America, there was one Croat yeah. from Karlovac. Uh, he was a medical doctor, and uh, okay, he, Ignaz von Born was not delighted with his knowledge, but what is interesting, uh, yes, yeah, Stupic. Uh, that uh, this guy, he left a diary of this transatlantic voyage, which is now preserved in the National Library of uh, the Austria, Austria yeah. National Library in Vienna. And for me, it's interesting how this uh, fact, okay, it's, it's not uh, something new, but uh, what happened to this knowledge, to, to his knowledge? Why <coughs> his knowledge was not uh, interesting for uh, Croatian historiography, let's say. It's because of this national approach. So the knowledge in, in these uh, notes is, was not something that uh, contributed to the development of the Croatian identity. I'm sorry for, for being uh, critical, but those people were hard work subject. So Stupic was going um, across Atlantic as a hard work subject. He, he got a good opportunity. I think that he was a, a yeah, King's uh, student. He was with, with Meta. And with Martin, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and he was the one who was in that uh, carriage, I think that they had two carriages, and uh, he went there and he, he left, he stayed in America. Yeah. And, uh, and you don't have him in a Croatian biographical dictionary, for example. <laughs> so, and these are these connections that we can find, but since our <coughs> historiography, Croatian historiography is closed, then we, okay, in the 90s we were looking for Croats everywhere. So Croats, this Nicola Plantage and this missionaries, Croatian missionaries. So documentary films were made for this uh, about immigrants in different parts of the world. But I think that this transnational uh, approach in this global era is something that it's really positive. It's, it connects and you can find these connections in, in history, which we somehow we we really locked up the Croatian history and we were part of this world. We have had to have us for our kings. So especially people dealing with the military history, you know, and how many fronts these people were fighting and where they were all present. And, uh, and uh, Vlad and I, when we were in, we were in Vienna, we worked in Krik's archive for, uh, for two weeks and then last June. And uh, so, when you see those names and all those documents and records, they were writing and writing and writing. It was a very, uh, so the, the, the written culture was very important. I think that they spent half of the day in writing. Since there's so many documents and so many names. And, uh, like so it's really, yeah, yeah, but, but even more. And they, they had pens and they had to, you know, to 
when they were writing, it was not all at once. So they had to, how do you say, in calligraphic manner, and uh, it's really amazing. And, uh, and there are so many, in, in, in the military borders, so many names, so many nationalities, so many languages, and it's really a pity to, to be locked up in, in this national. Just, just, just on a note, in the, in the mm -hmm. talk I gave today, I don't call them Austrians or Hungarians, I call them Habsburg yeah, subjects, yeah, because they were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a nice way of formulating it, it's mm -hmm. when you write this in English, but I think it's, it matters because um, you need to escape those boundaries. You know? yeah, just yeah. as Judson in his book, it's great like book, wrote you know, the different types of names, like T.S., Tourist, and so on like that. It's kind of a supranational identity, so they ask. Thank to all our speakers today and the uh, excellent and motivating lectures. I have a, one general question, which I think is a very important for our PhD students. It's about transnational approach to historical research. What are the uh, advantages of transnational approach in comparison to uh, traditional national approach to history? If you can reflect shortly on that in a general way. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, well, I would certainly say that, for example, you can compare. That's uh, that's uh, you know one of one of the really if, if you take the risk and and uh, and uh, move beyond the, the, the national framework, then you can you can compare you gain material, and you can also of course it encourages teamwork, which is uh, uh, for example, and which I think it's good that we have doctoral students here because, for example, I can say that I. Uh, it was always very tough for me to, to move towards teamwork, but one realizes that it's, uh, it's, it's, abs it's absolutely worth it and very important, even when you are an introvert, 
but of course working across special boundaries mm. encourages to work. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to say I've always found something like perhaps with transnational mm. students being lots of more um, to be self-contradictory because you know back then it wasn't it, it, it's one unity back then in a sense. You know, if someone goes to Zagreb to Vienna they're not really crossing into another mm. country as such, but they are crossing into a different culture. And I think that cross-cultural approaches are, are perhaps better in that sort of sense to remind us that they're not national boundaries, but rather they're just different cultural streams and communities. And all of our things today have highlighted mm -hmm. that. You know, the fact that your stuff is, is in the Tyrolean archives, right, and these connections between Northern Bohemia and South Tyrol, or, uh, you know, in the case of uh, Bologna, mm -hmm. you know, and Lillian College and so on like this, mm -hmm. I think it just brings home how if you are to do transnational history, you also have to go physically to other places. Mm -hmm. You know, but there mm -hmm. has to be work done not just in one place, in one locale, or one city mm -hmm. anymore. That's that's 19th century, you know, Prussian mm -hmm. history, and mm -hmm. I think that also speaks to how we need support and we need funding and we need mm -hmm. logistics and so on like this um, in general. Our institutions need to be geared for it as well. So you can't just think I'll do transnational history without a plan and you need mm -hmm. that sort of yes. support from our institutions. And I think that's very, very important. In my case, I have the absolute pet, we would say in Germany, you know, like, like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, for a crap hand. <laughs> 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 yeah, right? So, I had the absolute bad luck in my case that I was a, a Welshman in Scotland studying Austrian <laughs> and American history. Right? So how, how, how helpful is that? <laughs> right? At the time of the Scottish referendum, which might make things even more interesting. And then King Brexit. So so from my side, I was so dependent upon these, you know, grants or these funding bodies, um, which were very generous and very helpful, because I was able to go to America to get sources. I was able to come to Europe, I was able to come to Austria and spend time, mainly in Austria, but also in other places to get these sources. So, you know, it, it, there has to be a plan as well and an opportunity, but I think that's not to direct the PhDs who already have enough of these bodies, it's to direct the people who control the money and the funding levels or have the, the attention of those people. We need that kind of support, especially for places like Croatia. And if you start these kind of societies, because we need to bring in places that are missing, it's so important. So everybody, you know, don't make friends aboard. <laughs> the very fact that we do research in foreign archives makes our history transnational. Yes, absolutely. So, this is a fact, and in every project we have to plan the budget for going abroad, mm -hmm. in the archives. <laughs> and uh, it's really, it just has to be, so this awareness that we are doing this uh, transnational, it's, uh, it should be somehow brought to light and emphasized in our work. And it's not so only Croatian history anymore, it's uh, Central European history, or Mediterranean history. Thank you for, for the lectures. Uh, in, in, the, in context of this uh, discussion about uh, concepts and theories, maybe also a general question for, for, for all of you. Uh, could, could you comment uh, this? Uh, so it's, it's basically comment slash, slash question. Uh, comment this balance between uh, concepts uh, which we uh, uh, use nowadays to interpret uh, this empiric uh, uh, his historic uh, uh, historical moments uh, and 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 the, and the empirical which we uh, about which we write uh, for example uh, this uh, sport story uh, so uh, uh, professor Chapska, Chapska uh, lecture uh, we have on, on the one on, on the one hand uh, we we get whole new perspective using uh, various uh, uh, various contemporary approaches, uh, but on the other hand, for instance, we have a fact that a, a man was like an ordinary pre-modern guy in the sense that he basically used his daughters as a workforce and he. Forced, uh, forced the daughter into a marriage and, uh, and basically when, when the, I think Eleonora died the whole project had to be modified and it shrinked in a way 
So, or, or, or for instance, uh, in this Atlantic, uh, Habsburg Atlantic story, we talk about uh, uh, Habsburg monarchy getting into this big geopolitical trade game. But as you, uh, as you mentioned in the start of your, uh, at the beginning of your article, in the beginning of the 19th century, it had only one sextant. Uh, old, old Navy. So where is this balance or where is this limit up to which we can go with our contemporary concepts and theories and where, where do they like, crush and meet with the, with the facts of the historical moment? Yeah, but before I ask, uh, Luka Jakubcic, one of the top students. Thank you, Luka. It's a very good question. It is, yeah. I, I, I don't know how I'd really address it because I think it's it's just really that you know as we all as we're all trained in a certain sense it's first to develop an idea of you know what topic then what are the sources then what are the interpretive models right I think that's generally how it might go for a lot of people um, or in other ways but it's always that question of when sources are missing or when there's there's something that goes against that how you have to be flexible to change your or understanding of it. I, I can't really say how, how, it's, how it is in my case. I've never had so, so many problems with balance. I mean, most of the things I've started on, I've always thought that there would be nothing, uh, you know, to do really, like, not many sources or not, not great possibilities. So when I started my PhD, for example, as was pointed out, I did it on the American Revolution, but my first thought was to do it from the time of the Revolution up to 1838, which is when um, the Austrian Empire established formal relations with America. The reason I chose that 60 year period from say 1778 until 1858 was because I thought there'd be an abundance of sources for 60 years. But if I did it just on one 10 year period, there would be nothing. And I was completely proven wrong when I went to the archives and saw that there was a huge amount and more than enough just for the American Revolution. And so it sometimes, when you have an empirical overload, you also have to recalibrate um, not only then what you want to do in terms of the theme and the topic, but then also the concepts. So something that, you know, writing about the American Revolution uh, has a very specific focus in terms of something that stretches 60 years across, you know, the satellite sites and the, you know, the, uh, the period of the Napoleon Wars and so on. So for me, it was always led by the, the data and the surviving correspondence, the surviving the documentation, the empirical stuff first. Um, and I can't really say about buying balance, it was just more, I'm always led by the sources. I hope that gives you some sense of answer. Yeah, thank you. But it's a very good question, a very good student. If I, if I may add to it, of course, this is very rich, you know, um, theory, methodology, and the, the empirical material. But I always, uh, I try to advise to, to, to my doctoral students in Prague uh, that the, in terms of balance, that you need to find balance between between narrative styles and storytelling and analysis. And uh, we need to acknowledge that as historians, we, we can never do away without narrative. We always have to be storytellers, but we, we shouldn't overdo it because we are not writing novels. So, you know, it's, uh, again, it's don't be afraid of theory because uh, you need, you need uh, scientific tools. And uh, so, I, in a sense, I agree that it has to be about a balance between between uh, you know narrative aspects and then the theoretical or analytical aspects, and it depends. I mean, even every scholar chooses his or her style, but uh, um, of course, also um, you know, Central European historiography is very much uh, under the impact of the of the German language scholarship, which in history has been theoretically oriented. So it helps us communicate with uh, with German colleagues. But it, it essentially, it's it's also up to you. It's it's about in a in a PhD thesis, of course, you have to you have to prove your capability to to be a virtuoso um, um, uh, archival mouse, for example. But also that you have interdisciplinary thinking. So it's about both and not being not being afraid, but also about pursuing theory. I would say, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, what is the position of Habsburg Ottoman innovation within this new uh, field uh, of global history. How does it change? Did it change uh, some traditional and older views, especially regarding the 
then the, the Ottoman Empire was a total power and the Habsburg were total powers and they encompassed mm -hmm. non territory culture and uh, people. And uh, the fact that there was enormous uh, interchange between the, the two empires, which mm -hmm. can be seen, especially on the borderlands like Russia and etc. And then mm -hmm. uh, disseminate also in the, to, the, in, to the European continent and further. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for instance, when we talk about people who uh, transferred knowledge, we have uh, people who were prisoners, uh, who spent uh, many years in uh, you know, the Ottoman uh, territories, came back, they were best sellers of like Croatian Michael Djurjevic, who we didn't even translate it, <laughs> his works, and uh, etc. So how the position of this relationship changed? Is it included or is it, 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 it's the focus now on uh, this uh, colonial world, uh, not European? Sure. Huh? Thanks. That's a really, really good question and um, yeah, something that wasn't in my, my talk as such. But I, I think of three sort of key examples to give you my answer here. Um, you know, I won't go into too much detail about uh, traditional absolute of Ottoman relations, but rather I want to show how we might be able to conceptualize these based upon a more and more global vision. So for example, um, to turn to the example in the talk about um, the Shah of Persia and acquiring these military advisors mm -hmm. to train them, uh, lead troops and to modernize the army in, in Persia, um, for which then the Austrian Hungarians were supportive and, and helped them do that. That also has repercussions in the, the Ottoman Hatsburg relationship and dynamic of that period in the sense that they are trading, or not trading, they are helping to modernize a historically very antagonistic neighbor on the other end of the, um, of the Ottoman Empire. So in some sense you can see when you take that into account what effects that has then for the Central European, uh, sorry, Central Asian uh, dynamics, but then also what uh, that has to do with, you know, Historic sort of Ottoman absolute rivalries and antagonisms. In the same way as, you know, for example, um, the siege of Vienna and these, these famous, example, uh, famous moments in Ottoman absolute history are in part also shaped by wider dynamics. I think the way I've often been taught myself and absorbed most of this is that, you know, this is an Ottoman versus Europe um, clash, or this is an Ottoman versus Europe dynamic. And in fact, you know, if you think of it from the global perspective of the Ottomans, they have the Safadids and so on on the other side. They have to balance constantly these, you know, these menaces further to their east. So when you broaden your horizon again, then you get this different dynamic that you know the siege of Vienna is not just because of you know such sort of Christian power or anything. It's because of you know uprisings happening in the east and the greater threat from the east means you need peace in the west. So I think it also always helps to broaden your perspective and then help to recalibrate that. In the same way as in the early 19th century during the Oriental crisis, and Metternich and others are quite keen to, um, you know, to weaken the Ottomans in a certain sense. Uh, they bomb ports um, in in, uh, in the Middle East, you know, along the the, uh, the coastline there. Um, in fact, like launch naval invasions. Right? We don't think again of Austria and Hungary being naval power, but they very much were in the early 19th century. This is also part of that. Um, early 19th century finding empire, as I think of it, for the you know, for the, the Habsburgs, in the sense of they're trying constantly to scout out weak points in other regions to exploit. Uh, I mentioned the Sudan and the, the sort of religious expeditions to Sudan and the founding of this outpost in this entire region. But it's also part of that as well, that the, the Oriental crisis is used as a way to try and probe possible sites of you know monopolies in terms of trade in terms of um, political power, of, of uh, finding stronger bases. You know, the Suez Canal then later on as well, the Austrian and the Hungarian Empire is very involved in that project. Uh, the engineers behind it are, are from Tirol and from other places uh, in, in Austria. Um, so I think it helps to reconceptualize it, not just in terms of border pictures, but to see also what's going on generally, you know, so to see it as part of a bigger imperialistic mission, say in the 19th century. And then, as I said earlier, to see it as part of then these wider foci, to see what's going on in other places and how that affects the balance of power between the two. So I hope that answers your question with some concrete points. But I'm happy to discuss it after with you. Mm -hmm.
once you start working with um, travel narratives, as I did, then of course uh, uh, it's either people traveling to the Middle East, but you also, uh, in, in, for example, in, in diaries and, and, and people documents, uh, people from, from, from the Middle East pop up as, as, as these globe trotters, so it's related to, to transcultural microhistory. But I would probably add that we should not forget about the Jewish culture, so the, the internal other. So if, we, if, you, if you want to venture into transcultural history, it doesn't necessarily have Overseas history, mm -hmm. it can be, it can be, you know, the, the, the close others that uh, that are present the, in Central Europe. The, the passion, yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, the passion is for yeah. Oh, yes. uh, okay, so I have a comment and maybe a question. I don't know. We'll <laughs> see. Uh, so thank you all for um, these methodological approaches. Uh, for whom I think that are very useful for us uh, PhD students. Uh, um, I have a problem for the last three years, I think. I'm working on my theoretical concept, and which I finished 13 hours ago, and now I see that I have to change it <laughs> to maybe involve some, some aspects that you uh, talked about. For example, I'm working on the concept of uh, knowledge and circulation of knowledge, and I didn't came across of Menel Castle. Not, not. So, uh, what would you suggest to um, to a PhD students uh, when it's time to stop reading, or I don't know, when it's time to stop over overthinking? Because in, in every book, the knowledge is uh, evolving. The articles there are so many. When I start reading one article, uh, numerous fields open up. And then I'm always, I think, at the beginning or in the process. So, or to wait five years, and after five years, when you finish your doctoral thesis, to see, okay, it's not okay for me. I found, find maybe um, the, the mode to to um, history of knowledge and accepting that also my knowledge is transferring every day, every week. So maybe that's. I don't know. What would you suggest for us to stop or go on or change it? Yeah, it's certainly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I would probably suggest that you know, of course, there is time to stop because everyone has to finish. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have to know <laughs> that it's 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 a good tool for your material that really you know provides uh, insights and it's it's a new fresh lens that uh, you know allows you new interpretations and once you have that tool once you have that analytical concept that fits in well then you know you can go ahead and, and forget <laughs> about that chapter theoretical and move on i guess okay. i've got two answers to it mm -hmm. a short one and a long one the short one is when your supervisor tells you uh, <laughs> and then the second one is um when you found what works for you in the sense of what excites you. So, yeah. as, as you were just saying here, that yeah. you know, knowledge today is overwhelming in the sense there's so many ideas constantly, so many new papers, and so many academics now, compared to you know, even 50 years mm -hmm. ago. And so you can never quite stay on top of all of that, especially you know, with PhD and other demands on your time and so on like this. So it is often best, I think, just to find the approach that is for you the most mm -hmm. exciting, because mm -hmm. you need to be excited about it in order to do some work about it, and then to stick with that and not worry about all the other things that come down to these yeah. things. Yeah, you can mention them, but you don't have to drop everything and then take that thing, because then there will always be something that comes along. Mm -hmm. So it's best to just stick with one that fits most and excites you most. And that would be my long answer. Thank you. But you motivated us, so I, I will have to change. <laughs> <laughs> the little part, not the whole concept, but just some some ideas. So thank you. And it's important that you like it. That you, yeah. that you found this Yes, I like useful. it. But yeah. I, each uh, everyone uh, version, it, it was all the same: history of knowledge and circulation. Mm -hmm. But those little aspects that 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 make the model complete and that. Uh, Give, give me the tools to answer all the questions that came about. So, yes, I will, I will stop. <laughs> okay. no, thank you.
Uh, I have a brief question, if I may. Uh, uh, I need Professor Shapka for you to tell me what is the follow-up on the translations that you have found, uh, whether you have just catalogued them or do you uh, plan to use the expertise of translation studies experts in the future and to study those translations furthermore as historical translations of value and uh, within some other aspects uh, and within, of course, an interdisciplinary approach that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, mentioned here and that is essential in uh, such research. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I would, I would, I li I would like to, to continue with the concept of translation hubs or translation centers, so centers of translation yeah. activities across Central Europe or, or in the Habsburg monarchy. And I, yeah, I look uh, into other examples of translating but also, um, also other sources, one of, the, one of the residual sources that was sort of a, uh, a side source which I didn't have time to elaborate in my habilitation project is actually a grant to travel writing of the son of Anna Katharina Johann Christian who, who took a, a grant who in 1750 and it sort of um, combines, it was a religious pilgrimage because it was a, it was a, a jubilee year but it also because uh, grant who was supposed to educate young men so it's also about uh, economic education and interest in... Yes, in, okay. Yes, I'm just so interested in the translations. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do, you, uh, do you have a catalogue of the existing translations in the, uh, within this uh, archive? I wasn't really uh, going after a catalogue. So I have in, in my... In the, in the habilitation, I, I listed the books I've worked with uh, mm -hmm. to a maximum, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really interested in, in doing something like an a exhaustive catalogue. Mm -hmm. So you do not, you don't have the titles, the authors, uh, the languages, uh, the, you don't have such uh, uh, information? I think I do have a working catalogue, but it was not, okay. it was not my mm -hmm. priority. And the second question, and the libretti, uh, uh, are they catalogued perhaps? Uh, because it, the libretti were printed in the originals, they were not, they were very rarely translated. We have in Croatia examples of right. Croatian mm -hmm. translations <coughs> of libretti, of Italian original libretti by Decastasio, but they were not used for opera as such as a, a musical performance, right. but for uh, uh, oral, uh, just for theatrical representations as, uh, as such. Or maybe not, maybe just read. Yeah, again, so I'm, I'm not so much interested in exhaustive lists, mm -hmm. so in that sense, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is no, uh, uh, not uh, yet a catalog or something or like a uh, 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 database uh, of uh, what the archive could yeah, there's, there's no Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So we, we have exhausted all questions. Yeah. <laughs> can, I have, can, I, can I have five more minutes at the end? To any of the audience? Yes, yes. yes. to make a connection. Important agenda. Yeah. To make a connection. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, just five more minutes and we will all come back from that. Do you want to send the sheet back if you sign it? Yeah, I would like uh,